Well, so there's a there's a lot to cover here. First of all, I think that uh, we on the supply side and our customers on the uh, and those on the customer side of the equation come for, to to this too often with an educational mindset where we don't know what's the application of the learner back on their jobs because maybe there's a whole variety and we can't cover all those applications because we whoever's conveying doesn't know what the application is. And Bob Mager, the late Bob Mager, talked about this in the mid 80s at, at an NSPI conference, now ISPI. And he said, why are we still arguing decades later about the difference between education and training? You already know the difference. And he said, for example, your child goes off to college and they write home, being the 1980s, they write home and tell you that they're taking a sex education course. Or they write home and tell you that they're taking a sex training course. Well, the entire room erupted. And of course, he said, see, you already know the difference between education and training. So our clients don't often expect this. And our L&D leaderships don't want to delve into that because perhaps they're doing communications to make people generally aware, or they're doing education to make people knowledgeable, and they're not always doing training, even if they call it training, which basically uh, enables people to use awareness, knowledge, and skills in some authentic job tasks to produce outputs that are authentic to what's required back on the job. So too often we're not doing uh, uh, training. We're, you know, now we've got this umbrella term learning as it covers everything and it, you know, has so many meanings, it's almost meaningless in my view. Um, but I'm, I'm a training guy. Now I would call it nowadays, I wouldn't call it training all the time. I would call it instruction as another umbrella term because instruction covers both what I call performance guides, what's been known as job aids, electronic performance support systems, performance support. It's instructional in that it guides the performer in how to perform, what to do, when to do it, how to look at the situation, decide which path to go on, whatever, depending on the complexity of the performance. Training is also instructional. Education is also instructional. And a lot of communications is instructional as well. So there's those two sides where, where either the performance context, and this is how you make the decision as to whether I give people job aids or training, um, does the performance context demand a memorized performance response? On demand, right now, no time to look anything up. You know, you better have it in the, your head and in your skill set, your uh, et cetera. And, and so either the performance context that the learners are going back to demands a performance response that's memorized or their performance context allows for a reference performance response where they can say, hold on just a second, let me look that up. Oh, here it is. Okay, now, and then they can perform. So we need to understand that performance context so that we can uh, help people learn and master the behavioral tasks, the cognitive tasks that go before, during, and after the behavioral tasks, because the behavioral tasks we can we can see, we can monitor, we can measure, we can count them. The cognitive tasks we can't do that because you know it's just you can't you know see pe what people are thinking. They can tell you, and they're usually wrong uh, and incomplete, is what the research shows. So we need to understand those tasks, both types and understand that those tasks are a means to the ends of producing a product, an output, or rendering a service that some downstream customer uses. We produce outputs that are inputs downstream. It's kind of the quality movement model, uh, which is very familiar. It's inputs, process, and outputs. Now, the late Gary Rumler and the late Dale Brethauer put another box beyond outputs that was called the receiving system. So that's the customer. And you either meet their needs with your output, which is their input, or, or not. And there's a bunch of feedback loops. And one of those feedback loops is a consequence loop. Like, I don't like the products you're giving me. I'm never doing business with you again. I'll find somebody else. And so that's one type of consequence. So when we produce a learner who has learned something, their receiving system is the job itself. They go back to the job. And now... 
we have to understand as uh, instructional designers or learning experience designers, um, what is that context, that job context, that performance context that people are going back into it? And, and will it be accepting that Guy has learned some new things, some newfangled things that are different than the old fangled things? And what, is that system going to accept that or reject it? And so let me back up now. So when I start projects as a consultant and I try to convince my client, the requester, to form a project steering team of their customers, their stakeholders, the training manager, director, vice president, whatever, has got has going to do, do a project and it's, you know, it's for an audience and who owns that audience? Can we go up a level or two in the management chain and find people there whose whose numbers as managers will reflect people performing better, faster and cheaper or the opposite. So so we've got them by the numbers and they have should have a self-interest in getting their numbers to look better because maybe it ties to their annual bonus, et cetera, or their career aspirations or whatever. But anyway, so if, if we start talking performance rather than learning, that we're all about improving performance and learning is a means to able to the ability to perform tasks, which is the, the means to producing outputs of value that have meaning and impact. All right, so if we talk to our client and get them to form a project steering team, more formal than not, those people can help us by sanctioning our project, making sure that it makes business sense to them, what we're all about, what we're intending to do, what is our terminal objective of this project to produce people who can do X, Y, and Z, and not necessarily A, B, C, or G, E, F, or whatever, but you know, focused on something that's tangible, meaningful to them, and focused on performance, not on topics, uh, out of context or knowledge out of context or skills out of context or behaviors out of context or competencies out of context, but in context, in a performance context, says we're going to improve that performance, not generalities, but specific, uh, specificities. Um, and so when I've, when I've uh, successfully for, and all the projects that in mind that have failed, been, been miserable failures at usually a pretty good price, um, they failed because they didn't have the project steering team in place who could tell us, point us to our sources for individual interviews, observations, documents to review. And they could also tell us who not to talk to, who not to observe, who not what documents not to refer to because they're no good. And how would we know that if we don't live in that world? And so they can take ownership of the project that we're doing on their behalf and their learners' behalf, their performers' behalf. But when we do that, when we have them, we can plan the project with them, show that to them our plans and get them to prove it or to modify it. We can, they can resource our project with the right people at the right time to do the right things because otherwise we're scrambling and trying to pull people out and ah, you know I got I'm busy to do other things. Well, if your boss's boss has said you will be there and you will participate, it's more likely to happen. Um, the whole notion of, of, of having to, uh, if you have to explain why this training is necessary, something is wrong in the get go of that. You know, why, you know, if that, if the name of the, of the project or the course or the job aid doesn't resonate and scream performance, then something is amiss and we're doing things, uh, you know, that will involve far transfer versus near transfer. But when I've gotten the project steering team assembled, um, I, I do what a thing I've, I've written about this in a couple of books and I've talked about this on a couple of, uh, 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 podcasts and webinars and such where I say, you know, in my very first meeting with the client, when I'm showing them the project plan, before we've done analysis, before we've done design, before we've done development, before we've gone to do a pilot test, I start worrying out loud about transfer. And I've had clients and, and stakeholders on these project steering teams say, guy, you've not even done the analysis. I mean, you're going to go through all these steps here. You said not, you're already worried about transfer, which happens when the dust settles on your project and it goes out and it's being used and learned and applied why are you worrying about transfer now and i go because it's where everything falls apart and fails 
And I said, you know, I, I worry about transfer. So my role is to make sure that I give you authentic instruction, job aids and or learning experiences that will actually help people perform back on the job. What I be always worry about is will the person that's learned something that's kind of new or very new and different, will the supervisor stop it cold by saying, guy, I don't understand what you learned. I want you to do it the old way because I know how to manage that. I know how to monitor that, troubleshoot that, and manage that. But you're doing something different. I don't, I don't like it. So then I would always say, well, my client Eli Lilly back in the mid-90s used to force all of their vendors that whenever they produced a training product, that they produce something for the supervisor too. Because the supervisor needs to understand what the heck has guy learned and what's my job and how do I manage this now? If it's something very different than what it was before. Or maybe it's slightly different and I need to be watching guy when he comes back and look for those nuanced differences and and reinforce that, give him cor- you know, reinforcing feedback or corrective feedback because he didn't do it right. He backslid. He skipped those steps in the process. What the hey? And that's my job as supervisor. And I said, now you guys on the project steering team, you own all of these people. They report to you through, you know, successive levers of layers of management or something. And so you're the only ones who actually are responsible for transfer. And that's why I'm worried. I don't know if you're going to be doing your job. And they'll, you know, you got some a bunch of division, uh, say, regional sales managers or whoever they are going. What do you, you know, what? And but but what I've started to say has made sense to them because I've seen this before. They've been they've been in that movie theater before and seen the same movie multiple times. The sequel is the same as the. And so they they are. I'm challenging them obliquely. And I'm challenging them about their role and responsibility that, hey, we on the supply side can produce some stellar instruction and put your people through that and make give them the initial competence and confidence to go back to the job and apply it. But if that receiving system, that box after pro- input, process, output, if that receiving box there is not receptive, they'll stop it. And that means not only did we not get a positive ROI, we're going to have a negative ROI. We're going to spend a whole bunch of bucks and spend a bunch of time where people could have been doing something else and it's all for naught. And that's a negative ROI. And that's not on us in, in the in the learning and development world. I mean, we can do our thing here. You can hold us accountable for doing our thing and we can measure that too. But when we, when we can prove that people like it and they have learned it and then now there's a transfer, that's on you, not on us. And that's eye-opening for my clients, for the other people on the instructional team here that are here listening in, sitting into this meeting. And But I'm challenging them that they've got to do their thing, uh, their side of the equation. They've got to work on that to make sure they're transfers. So they need to explain it to their managers and the troops and the learners. They need to ins- expect it. They need to inspect for it. And they need to reinforce it by providing positive consequences for the people that are doing it and negative consequences for the people that aren't, for whatever reason. And then they can do some troubleshooting to say, why aren't they doing it? Now, one of the things I learned from the late Gary Rummler, back in 1981, he speaks on a video that was recorded at Motorola in 1981. First thing he looks at, is there a process? Well, yes or no. If there is a process, are people adhering to it? And if not, why not? He said, the second thing I, I look at, it, because I'm giving the learner, the performer, the benefit of the doubt. I'm looking at the what Deming called the system. What's the system? And so if, it, if you got a process and it's a good one and proven to work and people aren't adhering to it, why not? If they are adhering to it and you're not getting good results, then it's the process. But otherwise, the second thing he would look at is the consequence system. Is the consequence system in place a formal or informal consequence system, is that inhibiting performance? Is that stopping things? Are we punishing our best performers by loading up so much work that they finally get smart and they slack off? And it looks like performance is degrading here. Well, actually, no, (laughs) the consequence system is balancing out because people aren't dumb. They're going to figure out that, you know, hey, uh, 
you're not giving guy as much work as you're giving me give that slacker more work and, and expect him to do it rather than load it all on me so that i can through heroics save the day so i mean there's a lot to all of this um, but it all goes back to the beginning of a project where you're focused on performance, you're aligned with the stakeholders, you are getting pointed to the sources that you should use by those stakeholders, you're getting their buy-in that we're doing this for them and not for us. And quite frankly, too often learning and development organizations are off doing whatever they think is appropriate and nice to do or needed to do, but they're not really aligned and they're not working on things that are critical, the critical business issues, as Rumler used to call them, of the enterprise or of functions within the enterprise. Um, and if we're not working on those critical things, then nobody's got any energy for that. And they may not expect you to measure it because it's education, isn't it? What, what, what do you mean by training? I don't even know the difference. Then you use Bob Mager's little story and they go, oh, yeah, I think I see the difference here. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of this has to do with everything on the front end of your project and not the stuff near the tail end.